Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, quick voice check. You guys can hear me in the back. Great, awesome. Uh, well, thank you for coming to this presentation and good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Chetan Kapoor. Uh, I'm a product manager with uh, the Amazon EC2 team. And really excited to share some of the details around one of our latest uh, instances, P3, uh, which currently are the most powerful uh, GPU computing uh, platform out in the industry. Uh, Co-presenting with me uh, is going to be uh, Nick and Alfredo with uh, Airbnb. Uh, these gentlemen are part of the uh, ML infrastructure team, and they will share with us how Airbnb is using machine learning for their applications and uh, how does uh, P3 uh, kind of fit into the overall picture. To get started, um, the slide I created it actually before uh, our keynotes uh, this morning, and so it needs to be updated. But overall, you know, EC2, uh, we have a broad portfolio of instances uh, ranging from uh, general purpose, uh, T2, M4, uh, and now M5. Uh, and we have uh, C4 and C5 instances for the compute optimize. Uh, and over the last few years, uh, four or five years to be specific, we have been steadily investing uh, in a category of instances, uh, what we call as uh, the accelerated computing instances. So, so let's talk a little bit deeper about uh, our current portfolio uh, for, these, uh, for these type of instances. Uh, and essentially these instances have some form of a hardware accelerator uh, that complements the vCPUs and memory uh, that are available uh, as a part of that instance. So uh, uh, P2 instances, we actually launched them September of last year. Uh, they are based on NVIDIA's uh, K80 accelerator. Uh, and they actually are useful for a really wide set of uh, compute, GPU compute applications, uh, such as machine learning and deep learning, um, you know, high performance applications, uh, you know, financial computing and batch processing and rendering applications. Uh, our G3 instance, uh, we actually launched it earlier this year, about four or five months back. Uh, it based on an M60 GPU, and it's actually targeted towards uh, graphics uh, workloads. Uh, such as 3D rendering, uh, virtualization, uh, VR, video encoding and decoding. And uh, one of our newer additions uh, in, our, in this portfolio is uh, F1 instance, which we announced uh, reInvent last year uh, and made generally available uh, in April this year. And F1 instance uh, provides access to FPGAs uh, with that instance. And FPGAs, as to quickly recap, uh, give you the ability to uh, you know, customize the acceleration by targeting uh, you know, custom design hardware. Uh, and these, uh, these instances are good for applications such as uh, financial computing, uh, genomics, uh, accelerated search, data analytics, and, and image processing. So one of the common questions that I get um, you know, with, with this portfolio uh, from customers uh, and partners uh, is around uh, the different type of compute options we, are, we have and that are available in the industry in general and how they compare against each other. So I want to take a minute or so uh, to kind of talk through these compute options that are available. So generally speaking, uh, at a high level, uh, we have uh, CPUs, GPUs, and FPGAs uh, that can be used for various forms of computational workloads. Right, so as we all know, CPUs, um, you know, uh, they've been around for a while. Uh, usually have tens, in some cases hundreds, of processing cores. Uh, and they actually come with a predefined instruction set. Uh, besides that, they also have predefined data path. For example, they support you know, uh, floating point 64-bit numeric data type, or FP32. So they come with these fixed data types and fixed instruction sets, and they're optimized for general purpose computing. So again, really wide range of uh, applications that they're suitable for. Uh, GPUs, on the other hand, uh, usually have thousands of processing cores. And they come with, similar to CPU, they come with predefined instruction sets and predefined data path width. Right? And just by the nature of having thousands of these processing cores, they're highly effective at parallel execution. And over the next few slides, I'll actually give an example uh, of uh, a specific operation type uh, that benefit greatly from GPU acceleration. Uh, FPGAs, on the other hand, uh, are actually uh, you know, hardware devices that actually need to be programmed. They provide access to 
millions of programmable logic cells. Uh, they don't come with an instruction set. You have to program them. And similarly, they don't come with a predefined uh, data path width. If you want to use uh, eight bits or seven bits or five bits to kind of represent your number, you can do that. You can actually program the FPGA to kind of support the data type. And uh, one of the big differences between FPGAs and GPUs and CPUs is FPGAs, uh, the execution is actually hardware timed. So there's a concept of a clock, and every clock tick uh, translates to an execution of uh, the actual FPGA engine. So again, at a high level, uh, this kind of summarizes between CPUs, GPUs, and FPGAs what, what, uh, what compute options are generally out there and how they, how they uh, compare against each other. So talking a little bit about P3. Uh, so P3 instances, they're based on NVIDIA's latest uh, Tesla V100 GPU. Uh, it's based on their Volta architecture. Um, so these in, uh, instances are currently industry's most powerful uh, GPU-based platforms available. And they provide up to one petaflop of computational performance in a single instance. So that's just staggering performance right there. Uh, as compared to P2, uh, and again, I'll share more details around these uh, specific uh, performance improvements. Uh, machine learning applications or applications in general that can take advantage of floating point 16-bit uh, numeric data type uh, will actually see a 14x performance improvement uh, over P2s. Uh, high, performance high performance computing applications uh, that are you know, sensitive to uh, numeric data type and precision that, that use FP64 um, will actually see about a 2.6x uh, performance improvement uh, over P2. And once again, I'm going to get into uh, details around these comparisons. Talking a little bit about the, the Tesla V100 GPU in detail, uh, the GPU uh, is based on a 12 nanometer manufacturing process. Uh, it's got over 20 billion transistors on it, which is actually 40% higher uh, than NVIDIA's previous generation uh, GPU. At the same time, uh, it is actually 50% more power efficient. So what that means is, although NVIDIA has increased the number of transistors that, are, that they have packed into the GPU, they've also optimized the power efficiency. So essentially in the same power envelope, they have actually packed in more performance, and this really comes through um, in some of the performance benchmarks. Uh, they have added a new functionality called as tensor cores, uh, and I'll, uh, again, I'll get into details around what these tensor cores are and how they help uh, with, uh, with boosting mixed precision performance. Uh, there are 640 tensor cores uh, that are available on a per GPU basis. And uh, that translates to 125 teraflops of mixed precision performance per GPU. To, count, uh, to round out some of the details um, around this GPU from NVIDIA, uh, it provides their second generation NVLink uh, GPU, to, GPU to GPU. Uh, communication link, uh, which provides up to 300 gigabytes per second uh, of total throughput for inner GPU communication. Again, I'll get into details on what that really means for applications that you guys are working on. And then 16 gigabytes of GPU memory uh, per GPU uh, with peak memory bandwidth of 900 gigabytes per second. So again, a really performant GPU, uh, a really high performance GPU from, uh, from NVIDIA. Now, to, to kind of walk through, uh, walk through uh, how GPUs uh, really uh, you know, uh, help boost performance, uh, I, want to use a, I want to use this example here uh, where uh, I'm, uh, this example is representing a matrix multiply of two matrices that are uh, three by three in size. Uh, and, and as you can see on matrix C, that kind of represents uh, how, t how you would calculate the result uh, matrix uh, C. So just walking through the actual calculation, uh, C11, which is the first cell in the matrix C, uh, is going to be calculated as, as I've depicted in the slide, uh, where you're multiplying elements in the first row of matrix A with, with the elements in the first column uh, of matrix B, adding them up together to kind of come up with uh, the actual uh, resulting C11 um, uh, result. Now, if you were doing this operation on a CPU uh, versus trying to farm it out over a GPU, for a three by three matrix size, you probably won't see a performance difference. So it's not really advantage advantageous for a matrix of this size. But 
if you scale out where your matrix uh, are 1024 by 1024, like 1K by 1K matrix, and you're multiplying that matrix uh, with another 1K by 1K matrix, uh, then these multiply and accumulate operations really add up quickly in the total number of operations you need to do. And this is where GPUs can come in and really help out, right? So like I mentioned previously, you have thousands of these cores at your disposal, at a, at your disposal in a GPU, and you can actually farm out these multiply and accum accumulate operations uh, over these thousands of cores you have available, get the results back quickly, um, and, and achieve pretty significant performance boosts uh, over a CPU-based implementation. Another important data type, another important fact to consider, uh, specifically when using GPUs for computational um, enhancements, is around the numeric precision uh, that is used uh, in these kind of operations, right? So you have, um, you know, you have FP64 that represents uh, 64 bits used to represent a floating point number. Uh, then you have single precision, which is FP32, uh, and then obviously you have FP16, which actually represents uh, you know, 16-bit floating point numbers. And the reason why that is important is because of uh, the tensor cores that have been made available in this new GPU. So in addition to the over 5,000 CUDA cores uh, that are available uh, in the GPU, uh, there are 640 dedicated tensor cores, uh, like I mentioned earlier. And each tensor core is actually designed to, to, uh, to uh, to process uh, the operation that I've described as uh, D is equal to A multiplied by B times uh, added with C. So again, if you go back to the matrix multiply example that I gave earlier, uh, this is where these, uh, these new tensor cores like really step up where they're dedicated for operations that involve multi multiply and accumulate uh, across these smaller, uh, th these data types uh, around FP16. So again, so, uh, so that, that's essentially the, one of the core functionalities of the tensor cores. Uh, with the performance advantage uh, that you actually end up seeing uh, really comes through. So in the two charts that I have, the one that is on the left, uh, it's actually comparing uh, FP32, or the single precision uh, performance of the V100 GPU as compared to NVIDIA's previous generation GPU, which is the P100. Um, and uh, the, two, the set of columns you're seeing at the bottom, I'm not sure if it's coming through on the screen, but you, it's the matrix size representing. So, so if you look at the second set of uh, columns, for a 1K by 1K matrix multiply, the V100 provides almost a 2X uh, performance improvement over the P100. So that's, that's good, you know, uh, 2X is pretty good. But on the other side, if you look at the other graph that is towards the middle of the, the slide, uh, that is showing when, if you switch down to FP16, the kind of performance boost you actually get. So these, ten, these tensor cores um, really, uh, really step up when it comes to trying to perform uh, FP16-based uh, uh, numeric operations, where you're seeing close to uh, 10x, 9x uh, performance improvement uh, over the uh, Pascal uh, 100 GPU. So bringing this back to EC2 and the instances we have, uh, P2 instances that we launched September of last year uh, use the K80 accelerator, uh, which is based on their Kepler architecture. And P3 instances, our latest one that we launched um, you know, a few weeks back, uh, based on the Volta architecture. And uh, this slide kind of compares the performance improvement across the different numeric precision uh, types uh, for these accelerators, right? So in the first chart, we are comparing uh, mixed precision or FP16 performance. Um, K80 actually does not support FP16 data type. Uh, so the max you will get is when you're actually using uh, FP32. And if you just compare share the teraflops of what you can get in P3 versus P2, uh, it's 14x. Uh, if you look at FP32 performance specifically, uh, it is around 1.7x. Uh, and uh, FP64, uh, the, the increase in teraflops uh, is around 2.6x, right? So for machine learning applications, we actually did an internal benchmark where we used uh, MXNet as the framework, uh, ResNet 50 as the model, and ImageNet as the data set uh, to actually uh, benchmark the performance of uh, P3 versus P2. And for machine learning training, 
uh, we are seeing an over uh, 7x uh, performance improvement um, over, uh, over P2s and over the KADBS platform. So again, really exciting performance boost, uh, you know, generation over generation uh, between P2 and P3. So again, dive a little bit deeper on the instance sizes and some of the specs uh, around these instances. Uh, uh, we support three sizes, the largest one being uh, with eight GPUs in it, uh, 64 vCPUs and almost half a terabyte of RAM. And uh, we, actually use, uh, we actually use NVLink uh, as a mechanism for peer-to-peer uh, -peer transaction between GPUs. And I'll have a few more slides uh, to go over details into how does NVLink compare uh, with PCI Express uh, for GPU-to-GPU uh, -GPU transfer. Uh, we support up to 25 gigabits of uh, networking throughput for the largest instance size. And uh, based on the increments that we were seeing in the EBS performance over the year, uh, P3 has a 40% performance improvement uh, over P2 instances. So the other thing that we paid a lot of attention to when we designed this instance was around the data throughput into this GPU, right? So again, these are, as I described, these are really powerful GPUs, and we want to make sure uh, that we can have uh, you know, really high throughput data pipes coming from the CPU into the GPU so that you can keep the GPU busy and, and have a high utilization of the GPU. Uh, so besides that, uh, we have also doubled down on making sure that uh, we have good peer-to-peer -peer transaction between the GPUs, again, with the intention of making sure uh, we can keep a high utilization um, of, the, of the V100 GPUs. So comparing P2 uh, and P3 when it comes to peer-to-peer -to -peer transfers and uh, host to GPU transfers, for peer-to-peer, for -peer, uh, there's a 9x improvement uh, between P3 and P2 that is mainly provided uh, via NVLink, uh, where we can do 300 gigabytes per second. For the CPU to GPU throughput, uh, we have also increased that pretty significantly where uh, on a per GPU level, uh, there's an 8x improvement and a 4x at the full instance size level. So let's get into details uh, and understand what does the actual data topology look like uh, for a P316XL instance. So uh, P316XL, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a dual socketed, or P3 is a dual socketed machine uh, where uh, in the 16XL configuration, you have access to both the CPUs and all the vCPUs they provide. Um, so if you start with one configuration, so let's talk about the CPU zero configuration. So uh, in that, uh, we actually have two uh, by 16 uh, PCI Express Gen 3 links uh, that connect to PCI Express switches uh, that you guys are seeing in the green blocks. And one PCI Express switch uh, that ends up connecting to two downstream GPUs. And then we repeat that configuration for the second set of GPUs in this, behind the same and then replicate that for the second set of uh, CPUs and GPUs. So that kind of talks about the, the architecture for uh, data throughput from the host CPU into the GPU. And like I mentioned, this is uh, uh, overall a uh, 4x improvement over what, what P2 can do. Now, NVLink is actually layers on top of this, where it's a direct point-to-point -point, uh, set of links uh, that connect GPUs to another set of GPUs directly. So each GPU uh, has six NVLink ports, and we end up leveraging those connections to connect all the GPU in a hyper-mesh configuration uh, to enable peer-to-peer -peer transactions. So let me give an uh, animation of how uh, this would actually translate. So uh, let's assume that we actually want to transfer data from GPU 0 into GPU 3 over PCI Express. So let's assume that NVLink doesn't exist and we want to use uh, PCI Express for that transfer. So in that case, uh, the data will actually take this path and will traverse over the, the PCI Express links down to the other links and into the, uh, the GPU3. In the case of NVLink, uh, it'll be a direct transfer. It'll just, again, directly go over the NVLink uh, and transfer data from GPU0 to GPU3. For uh, the other scenario uh, that is even more interesting is, is the scenario where you would want to share data from GPU 0 into GPU 6. So in this case, you actually, actually have to go through the quick pack interconnect that connects the two CPUs, which typically involves like a memory copy, uh, and that's the path that the, the data traverses. 
So in the case of NVLink, it is again a point-to-point -point link and uh, it's, a, it's a lower latency transfer. And by just the sheer number of NVLink connections we have, we can enable much higher throughput uh, over what we can do over PCI Express. So, so, so that kind of sums it up from like an instance, uh, instance detail perspective. Uh, I can just to summarize, you know, from an application and a use case perspective, uh, there are just two broad categories of applications that P3 is really suitable for. Uh, one is around the machine learning, ML slash, uh, you know, AI space, where again, the keynote this morning, uh, we highlighted a whole bunch of applications where natural language processing, uh, you know, image and video recognition and recommendation systems. And then another set of applications around high performance computing, where you have CFD, uh, financial and data analytics, simulations, and computational chemistry. Great, so now I would like to hand it over to Nick. Uh, Nick is a product manager with the Airbnb, and he's gonna share with us uh, how Airbnb uses uh, machine learning, and then uh, Alfredo is gonna join and talk about uh, some of the details around their architecture. Good, all right, thank you very much. Um, all right, so, so I'm Nick, I'm the, uh, Nick Handel, the product manager of machine learning infrastructure at Airbnb. And um, I'm gonna start off just set the stage of how Airbnb uses machine learning, and uh, then I'll go into uh, what the machine learning infrastructure team at Airbnb uh, is doing to, to help the rest of the company use ML. Uh, and then I'll hand it off to Alfredo and he'll uh, go deeper into the, our use of the P3. All right, so set the stage. Airbnb's mission is to create a world where, where people can belong when they travel by being connected to local cultures and having unique travel experiences. So a bit more about Airbnb, uh, just some stats. I think most of you are familiar with, with Airbnb, but um, kind of set the stage of the scale of the data that we're dealing with. Uh, so there are 65,000 cities uh, listed uh, with homes uh, on Airbnb, 4 million Airbnb listings worldwide, uh, 191 plus countries, and 200 million Airbnb guest arrivals all time. So that's a lot of data uh, that's gonna take a lot of compute. So, the, the really complicated thing about Airbnb and, and the need for machine learning really arises in marketplace dynamics. So we have guests on the left and hosts on the right with uh, their homes. So in, in kind of a standard marketplace, you have supply and demand and you want to you know, connect the supply with the demand. Um, but it's not quite so straightforward with Airbnb uh, just because of how unique some of the demand is and how unique some of the supply is. So there's this complicated matching problem where we have you know, unique guest preferences. Maybe they wanna check in early or they want a hot tub or they want uh, you know, uh, you know, a good space for their family. Um, there's a variety of needs. And then we have listings that can meet those different demands and hosts with uh, preferences also. You know, they might, they might not want, uh, you know, early check-in, they might have some preferences about what kinds of trips are happening at their home, maybe they really just want business travelers. Um, and so this kind of presents this, this complicated matching problem where we really need to understand both the guest and, and uh, the hosts and the supply, the listings. So, as you can imagine, there's a huge amount of machine learning um, that is required to make that dynamic happen. Um, but some, some quick examples. So uh, pricing these listings, you know, every listing is unique, so pricing them is pretty complicated. There's you know, unique amenities, and sometimes a listing will add a hot tub, and you know, it'll get more value out of that. Um, so we have these smart pricing recommendations where you, uh, you know, you'll, you'll need to price a listing out for every single day into the future. Um, and the, you know, if the listing changes, like they add a hot tub, you'll need to change those prices. And you also need to change those prices if there's different amounts of demand uh, for some, you know, different nights. And if that demand evolves, like if there's a big conference in town. Um, so we use it for risk, uh, bad actors detection, you know, protecting the community. 
We use it uh, to help grow the marketplace place by, uh, uh, you know, optimizing our ad budget. Um, you know, we have an experiences product now where there's a lot more personalization involved. Um, there's even more preferences involved in do you want to go, um, you know, do a, you know, a unique food experience or a unique music experience. Um, payments, customer service, examples of routing. Um, so I can go on and on, and there's all these different examples. Uh, but I want to give a more concrete example, just so you can kind of see why uh, deep learning is actually really important. So on the left, uh, this is the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, these are Airbnb listings in the different colors. So the clusters of colors are basically examples of uh, listings that uh, are commonly viewed together. So you can, you can see these areas where, uh, you know, they might want to stay in some specific city. And uh, that's really great, but it would, you know, all of these listings are really actually quite unique. And all of those listings in those areas are really not comparable. So on the right-hand side, uh, we've added listing attributes. So listing attributes are things like structured data, like is there a hot tub or not, or um, you know, is there Wi-Fi? Is there a washing machine? Those kinds of things where we can say yes or no, that exists. Um, but there's also you know, listing images, listing text, these things that require uh, deep learning to really extract structure from them. And so when you add that in, you really see that these pockets of demand are not really pockets, but they're kind of spread out. And uh, within some city, the, you know, the unique listings, there might be many different types of listings that cluster together. So now talk a little bit about the machine learning infrastructure team. Uh, so this is the team that we're a part of. Um, so machine learning infrastructure's mission is to equip Airbnb with shared technology to build production-ready ML applications with no incidental complexity. <clears throat> so a few kind of important parts of this. Incidental complexity, we define as basically something that if somebody does it, it shouldn't have to be done again. So you want to remove as much incidental complexity as possible. And, and the goal is to make it so that this doesn't happen. You, know, you don't have to repeatedly do the same kinds of things. So setting up environments, um, you know, defining future transformations on, on your data, uh, those kinds of things. Um, it's also important to note that it's, it's shared technology. It's not the ML infrastructure team builds it, and then the rest of the company uses it. It's kind of more like an open source uh, project within Airbnb, where we'll work on it, and we'll kind of lead the development. But really, the rest of the company should uh, contribute back and work with us on it. So we use this diagram to kind of help us think through our, our uh, infrastructure. There's <coughs> the machine learning workflow is this iterative process, right? Um, you know, you start off with data collection, you train your model. Uh, there's probably a huge amount of iteration that happens within that training. Uh, then you want to do inference. You want to serve that model to, to some production data. Um, and then you, you want to monitor that and make sure that that model is healthy, healthy. So at the center of that is this orchestration layer, where you really want to, to make it so that uh, you know, all of those things happen smoothly together. And without common uh, shared infrastructure that uh, connects all of these different tools, you end up in the outside of this circle. It's very slow. This, this, uh, I kind of think of this as like a flywheel. It happens really slowly. Um, and what you really want is you want this tight loop where all of these different pieces fit together really well. Uh, and it's, it's easy to to you know, um, train your models and improve them as quickly as possible. So you know, one of these is big machines. And, and I mentioned that that training uh, bubble is something that takes a long time. You, know, it's, uh, you want to you know, really iterate on models. You want to experiment, try new things. And, and that's really where the P3 comes in. The faster we can make that loop, and the faster that we can uh, test and, and produce better models, the faster this whole flywheel becomes. 
So now I'm going to hand it off to Alfredo uh, to talk a bit more about the ML workflow and, and some of the, the uh, uses of the P3 within it. Hey, can you hear me? Awesome. So um, Nick talked about some of the key pieces in an ML workflow. Um, you've seen them before, but I'm just going to walk through at Airbnb when you typically want to make a model kind of what's involved right now. Um, so generally, you're identifying a problem so that involves some sort of iteration on, on a couple of data sets usually. Um, you might want to figure out specifically, do I have a classifier or aggressor that's going to be my output? Um, maybe some kind of statistical model. Maybe it's an optimization problem. These are all things we encounter at Airbnb. Um, and we have to kind of make a good environment so it's easy to, to interact with that data. Right? The output of that should really be a data set or a super set of all the data you're going to want for um, actually exploring that problem. Um, so that's going to involve selecting what we call your features. Um, and these are going to be your direct inputs into your actual model workflow. Unfortunately, for many types of architectures, so if you're using like a neural network or if you're using a boosted model, um, you're going to have to pre-process that data. That might involve scaling, um, so like images, you might have to you know, resize them. Um, with some numeric data, uh, you have to transform it. Um, and with text data and free form, um, you know, NLP, you, you do have other more um, sophisticated embeddings as well. And after that comes what Nick talks about, which is a very long sort of iterative cycle of um, figuring out what model am I going to use. Um, you know, a lot of the times, um, you might want to throw simply like a boosted model at the problem and, and see how it performs and maybe move on to something more complicated. But if you're able to make that cycle very tight, um, if you're able to you know, train a model on a massive data set, um, maybe get the optimal such variation, um, tune your hyperparameters, and get results very quickly, then you're able to kind of sweep the landscape um, and really get something that's, that's very performant um, you know, into production, not really have to settle very early. Finally, some models do have to be put into production. Um, and this is often not a trivial thing. So you might need real-time inference where you have streaming data and you have latency guarantees. Or you might need regular batch training. Um, and you know, you're talking about petabytes of data that, that need to be scored on a daily basis. Um, so it's important to make that workflow very easy as well. Now, at Airbnb, here's sort of the, the state you know, we arrived at. Um, that was sort of the status quo. And that's a, for identifying the problem for iterative analysis, um, that's very much like a local workflow, right? Um, generally, you're going to have somebody working. It's preferable to work on your laptop um, or in an environment where you can kind of interact with the data. Um, so we developed um, something I'll talk about in a little bit. But um, we kind of have a, an environment where people can, can work in an IPython notebook and um, you know, interact with these massive data sets, um, access, if you're familiar with Airflow, um, and, you know, other resources to, to kind of transform petabytes of data and, and get what you need out. Selecting your features out is something that ultimately is going to be, you know, MapReduce job, uh, Spark job, um, some kind of heavy um, sort of workflow. Um, and that's not something you want running on your laptop, right? Um, so, Fundamentally, that's something that you have to offload. And that transition needs to be kind of easy to do. But you'll notice there's three squares here that are green um, that are actually pretty computationally intensive. Traditionally, for things like encodings and embeddings, um, for selecting your model, for doing hyperparameter tuning, um, your options are pretty much uh, you know, either you run in a local environment or you SSH into a box with some GPUs on it. Um, and you kind of do all that there. And when you want to go to production, then you have to translate that, you know, put it somewhere, and um, maybe add some additional code to actually productionalize it. As you can see, there's a lot of kind of pitfalls in that workflow, and yet it's a very, very common workflow at many companies, um, even around the Bay Area. Um, one of the big ones is people want to play with a lot of different models. Um, when you encounter a problem, right, it's nice to be able to just run something, five minutes later, know it worked, it didn't work, um, you know, how can I change it? Um, and that's not really possible because training is pretty slow. Um, and especially with newer and newer architectures, they get deeper and deeper and slower and slower to train. 
Um, so it's not uncommon for a day or more to be a, a reasonable timeline to get results back. Hyperparameter tuning is also something that's kind of overlooked a lot of the times. Um, typically, there are recommendations for you know, hyperparameters for different types of architectures, but they're not you know, locally optimal um, for your specific problem. So unless you're able to spawn you know, hundreds of these jobs and get the results back quickly, you're probably going to stick with what was you know, passable in production. And then as I mentioned, so P2 instances and P3 instances are great, but they're expensive, right? Um, if you have you know, 100 of these running, like, um, I'm sure that the budget for, uh, for your compute is going to kind of bloat pretty quickly. Um, and really, it's expensive because you're not using them most of the time, right? Um, giving users access to these so they can like, develop on them means that 90% of the time, they're actually you know, in Vim and not actually running a job. Um, so they're not you know, um, being kept hot. Um, and that just doesn't scale very well. And lastly, people, at least at Airbnb, want to use a lot of different frameworks. We don't like to impose that you must use TensorFlow, you must use PyTorch. Um, you, know, you should really be able to use kind of whatever you want and, and have it run in a performant fashion. So we thought of a couple of these problems and, and really started over um, the last year kind of formalizing a good end-to-end -end infrastructure that will let us accomplish all these things. Um, so I'm happy to announce Big Head by Airbnb. Um, and that's our attempt at really making this as friction-free as possible. Um, the biggest sort of, as Nick mentioned, thing we want to focus on is removing incidental complexity everywhere along the, the workflow. So the idea is that from start to finish, you should be able to uh, go in a Jupyter notebook, um, you know, play around with your data, explore it, analyze it, um, have access to all these data sources around the company. And if you want to use plain Python, you can use that too. Um, then you should be able to take that data, use whatever frameworks you want. You can mix them and match them. You can you know, have some pieces running in TensorFlow, some in PyTorch, some in plain scikit-learn, um, chain them together, get your features by simply clicking in a shopping cart, kind of like you know, going on Amazon and, and ordering a book, and getting your data out in a few minutes. Being able to version your models so you can figure out you know, which versions worked best. And even if you're developing locally, wouldn't it be nice to just click run on your model and have it deploy to a fleet of supercomputers? Um, that's something that we really wanted, and, uh, and P3s kind of make that possible for us. And a final piece that was so, so, so key and a lot of companies struggle with and we're hoping it to really crack is, why don't you just take your model that you worked on in this notebook and with one or two clicks have it running in production? Um, and that was really a key piece of, um, of this infrastructure. So to accomplish these things, um, our environment's Red Spot is, uh, is an in-house um, tool that kind of is a Jupyter notebook environment. You can um, spawn dedicated instances um, that you know, will be like a P3 instance. You can use a shared instance um, with many other users if you have um, lower compute requirements. But it's essentially a one-stop shop where you can access um, you know, all of your data. You can run Spark jobs from your notebook and everything and um, kind of work quickly and, and easily and iteratively there. Zipline is that shopping cart tool and feature engineering tool I mentioned um, that essentially lets you generate training sets um, with very, very minimal added code. Um, you just select the data you want, uh, maybe how you aggregate it, and, um, and we go ahead and run that for you in a distributed uh, fashion. Uh, for managing models, we have something called model repo. Um, this is something that we haven't really seen tackled too much before, um, but there's a lot of models at a company, and uh, eventually they get to a point where it's kind of hard to keep track of them. And um, semantic versioning is not something that's always great for, for ML. Um, you can't really stick like outputs of weights in, uh, in Git and expect that to work either. Um, so we, we developed something to, to better handle um, all the different variations you might have on a model and, and uh, all the different training runs you might have. And just have this really easily accessible just by doing get and, and put to this, uh, to this service. Um, to deploy to production, we have something called DeepThought. 
Um, and that really lets you to do um, like online scoring. Um, so you can have that same model running in a Docker container and, um, you know, and receiving calls via a little uh, lightweight shim on top. Now, where the P3 actually fits in here, and I'll be talking a little bit more about this, um, is a final component called BigQ. And that's what I mentioned where you're able to, from a notebook, um, dispatch your training runs to, um, to a fleet of servers with GPUs in them um, and get the results back. So no longer do we need to have somebody SSH in to one machine um, and run their model. We can you know, just do that from wherever. Um, and we can even scale that out. So to give you an idea of why this actually works and why the P3 made this possible, um, we did some benchmarks very early on. Um, so you'll notice that these are considerably slower than what was presented earlier um, because we were using pre-release versions of TensorFlow. Um, and we're also using FP32. But the interesting thing for us was, yes, P3 instances are, are faster you know, on a single GPU basis. Um, but when you look at something like ResNet 50, right, um, you know, it's nice to be able to scale up to eight GPUs. But historically, because of PCI Express's bandwidth limitations, when you scale out to like 50 GPUs, it doesn't actually scale very well. But with P3s, you definitely do get close to linear scaling. And um, I don't know if you saw like the Facebook paper where they trained ResNet 50 in an hour on ImageNet. Um, you can now get pretty close to that on a fraction of the GPUs um, and a fraction of the cost. We use something called Horova to do this. Um, it's a tool by Uber. Um, it uses MPI and NCCL, which is kind of NVIDIA's hardware accelerated uh, library for reductions and um, helps them compute the gradient. But essentially, while we were kind of uh, limited in initial testing to these number of instances, um, you should be able to scale this up, you know, probably two or three X and, and see, um, you know, not a huge reduction in your speed ups. Um, what this means, though, is when you see like a 71x speed up over, you know, a single GPU, um, you no longer have people running single jobs on a single GPU. Um, so now you have people running jobs that take a few minutes. Um, and because jobs only take a few minutes, we're able to do something like this. And this is kind of the architecture for BigQ. The idea is that as a client, you can dispatch these jobs, these asynchronous jobs, um, in a fashion that's very familiar to you if you've worked at HPC um, and if like schedule jobs to run on a supercomputer. Um, the difference is you can do this from a Jupyter notebook, right, with a library. Um, if you have like a TensorFlow model, we have you know, all these little wrappers for them and you can kind of just dispatch it to BigQ and when it's fit, you get your fit model back. It's serialized out. The actual run happens within Docker, so anything that you have in your environments in Jupyter, you have on your environments on the P3 machine. Um, or if you need 50 P3 machines or you know, 10 P3 machines, that'll all be there. Um, also, because we allow you to mix models um, and mix different types of frameworks, um, this means you can get some pretty complicated workflows in production with maybe 10 or 11 lines of code um, and actually train them in a few hours where it might have taken days or in the past really we would, wouldn't have even tried it. Um, additionally, there's one huge saving for us, which is you're keeping nodes hot. So if you have 10 or 11 users, um, you know, trying to run all these jobs at the same time, the machine's going to be kept as busy as possible, right? Each machine is um, allocated to task. If you don't have enough, we can actually use, because we're on the cloud and not on-premise, um, scaling to, to auto-scale this out. So if we initially reserve three or four, we can you know, go up to like 10 or 11 um, and kind of get the, the performance we need to you know, not have everything take an hour. Um, while at the same time, you know, not, not spending a ton of money doing it. So this is something we're really excited about. Um, it's really only possible because you have this amazing um, multi-node scaling with P3s, thanks to NVLink. Um, but we'll be, we're planning on open sourcing some of this stuff uh, in the near future. Um, so this is gonna be a, a pretty interesting little, little change in, uh, in ML Infra for many people. 
Yeah, cool. Uh, well, thanks, Alfredo. Uh, so yeah, just to summarize, uh, P3s, uh, again, one of the most powerful GPU platforms uh, in the industry right now. Again, pretty significant performance boost uh, over our P2 instances. And with that, uh, we'll open it up for questions. Nick and Alfredo, if you guys want to join me. You guys can walk up to the mics. Any questions? It's a phenomenal presentation. You guys got it. <laughs> This is great. Let me ask a question to Nick and Fredo. So uh, the, the new service we launched, SageMaker, how does that fit in? Uh, what do you guys think about it? Yeah, so, so <laughs> I think that there are, what, what's really interesting is that the way that we've thought about this is that there are so many different little pieces um, of this infrastructure. And you know, Alfredo talked about five of them, but really there are a bunch of even sub-pieces within those. And you know, we, we've, we've talked to, to the SageMaker uh, team, and I think that what they're doing is they're building it in a very similar fashion. And so that means that some of the pieces that we're working on uh, might, it, you know, it might actually make more sense for us to use SageMaker in some places. Um, and you know, in some cases, it might make sense because we have uh, such a specific uh, application at Airbnb to, to use the kind of custom in-house infrastructure that we're, we're building. Um, but I think that what's really cool is that it, you know, anywhere else, this means that that same thing can happen, where right. you know, somebody can start off with this, this big piece of infrastructure that does everything that, that they need, and then they realize that it doesn't do you know, everything that they need because they have something you know, very specific in-house, and then work on some custom solution. Um, but that's way better than, you know, Alfredo mentioned that we've been working on this for about a year. That's way better than a year ago when we were like, wow, we have to build a huge amount. And it's going to take forever to get it to a place where that workflow is, is you know, really fast. So Great. Thank you. We've got a question there. Yes. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, so you showed two types of interconnects, PCIe with QPI versus NVLink. Right. Uh, is it configurable for the customer, or how does it work, or is it all under the hood? Yeah, so it is, it is predefined. Like once you launch uh, instance size, like if you launch a 16XL, the topology is predefined, and you actually uh, get that pre-configured for you. So you don't have to go through the process of setting up those links or defining additional parameters to kind of set that up. Uh, if you go for like an 8XL configuration, you know, you basically get like one CPU socket with the four GPUs in it. Mm -hmm. You still have NVLink enabled, and that's also uh, already pre-configured for you. Oh, I see. Okay. Thanks. Great. Yep. Any other questions? Great. Well, thank you for uh, attending. Uh, we're going to hang out for a few minutes. If you guys want to uh, uh, stop by and you know uh, say hello, uh, we're going to be uh, we're going to be around. Again, thank you, and uh, hope you have a great conference. <laughs>